if you don't have thick skin, if you do not know what you're called to do, because I have had those moments in 14 years more times than I haven't. And last week, if you're going to do great things, you can't be worried about looking ridiculous. You can't be worried about a room full of people at which grows by the hundreds every year. You can't be worried about looking ridiculous. I wasn't worried about looking ridiculous with a pipe in my mouth. So I will teach, I will grind, I will study, I will try to motivate, I will try to correct and direct. Stand up, brother, in the hat that came up to me. You're going to Michigan. Stand up. For one guy like this that says, Pastor Jeff, tonight, I want to thank you. I just got a dream job down in Michigan, and it ain't about Pastor Jeff. It's about the teaching of the Word of God. He hugged me, and he thanked me. Let's give this man a hand. But last week when I was getting ridiculous and got a little out of hand, as I often do, uh, I noticed Newt. Newt, come here. Newt was willing to look ridiculous with me. Just like the one gal in that room, as everybody else said, this will never work. Your haters are your comp, co they compliment you. The ones that, that don't think you're going to do it, let them sit back and watch you do it. And I don't know if I've ever met a man as twisted as me, but he's no match to me, but he's right there with me. And I want to thank you for last week standing up and clapping and, and being with me because all I need is one with me. And I know through thick and thin, we've been through thick and thin, and I know your mind is crazy just like mine, but you're still here several years later. And your loyalty is pure, even though you're crazy as a bed bug. <laughs> but you know, and I want to thank you, and that's why I played that video, because of what I experienced with you and I last week during Tuesday night as I close. God bless you. Thank you. Love you. Because you gotta be, you gotta, you gotta be uh, uh, really not worried about looking ridiculous. You gotta know that as you're teaching and as you're elevated and people come and people go, that not everybody's ready to obtain the information. It doesn't mean they're a bad person. It's just that they just have not gone down far around down the road of addiction. I met another young gal who's not an addict, but her mother is. She was in tears in my arms earlier tonight as we started the meeting. And, and, and there's so much hunger here. But if you're not ready for this, that's okay. But it hopefully will still be here when you are. Because I am not afraid to look ridiculous. I am not afraid to get aggressive and direct and, and teach with passion and study for hours for this message. Hoping that at least one person, it will adhere to it. And if you can't adhere to it, that's okay. We don't not like you or like you anymore or less or love you anymore. It's just, I've been there. I've been through 11 treatments. I've been in these rooms. I, this wasn't available to me back then, so I'm grateful that it's available to me now. But here's the thing. I mean, when you start on this journey, the faces will change on the people that are with you. So you are the only person that needs to know, is this for you or not? And we are here 14 years later because of But you will never be able to do this without joy. Say joy. joy. Lord, I thank you for another day above ground and out of prison. Lord, I ask that you give me the words through your word to um, articulate and accurately describe what your joy is. Lord, your joy has nothing to do with happiness. Lord, we love you and we thank you and we, we just applaud you for what you're doing in and through us. In your name we pray, amen. A lot of us are chasing happiness. I, I did a sermon years ago on happiness, and it was a difficult sermon to do because there's not much in the Bible about happiness. You do not see the word. And, and if you're just longing to be happy, um, happiness is often tied to circumstances. And circumstances can change in a blink of an eye. You know, we had a family here that was dealing with a suicide on Sunday night. I, I, was, I was counseling with somebody yesterday that tried to take their life. Somebody died this morning that used to be part of this community. So circumstances can change. And if your whole level of happiness is based on circumstances or things, I mean, if my happiness is based on my job, what happens if I get fired tomorrow? Or if my happiness is based on if she's happy, what if she's mad? Then I'm not going to be happy. There's a big difference between happiness and joy. And I love the definition of the word joy. It says an emotion. Now, an emotion is a feeling. Now, a lot of us are not very good at processing our feelings. 
So we go to treatment, we go to therapy, we go to psychology, and we go get psychiatric help. I've had them all. And we learn how to feel. And by learning how to feel, it's kind of scary when you learn how to process your feelings that you've been stuffing your whole life. And then you come out of treatment after being taught how to feel and process and communicate your feelings, but you're so full of shame and guilt that you feel like such a victim and there's been many victims of you, so you still don't want to share your feelings. Well, the, the truth of the matter is, and the biblical fact about the thing is, feelings are great and you need to feel them, and the fact about feelings, they're not right or wrong, they're just yours. And if they're your feelings, they're not right or wrong, they're yours. But you can't live by feelings. You have to live by principle. This is a principle. The, the AA says practice these principles in all your affairs. Not practice these feelings. I mean, God Almighty, if we did what we were going to feel like doing, we wouldn't even be alive. We're definitely doing a life sentence. So, so this joy thing that I want to talk to you about quickly tonight has nothing to do with happiness, even though happiness is tied to us. Tied to it. It's not the foundation of what it is that the majority of us chase after. We're chasing happiness. Well, we've had happiness. So why did we run from happiness once we obtained it? Like we had all the things that we thought we needed and wanted, but we still left those things. Because there's a difference, and it's an emotion that is acquired. Anything that's acquired, that, uh, that you acquire, that means you have to work for it. You have to understand that joy is an emotion that is acquired by anticipation. Oh, that's a problem right there. Because as soon as an addict gets a level of anticipation for anything that they think they can make them happy, they ain't going to wait for it. But joy, the definition of joy is um, an emotion that is acquired by anticipation, by acquisition. That means that if you have joy, the world can't steal it. If you have joy, um, even if there's one person clapping out of uh, 300 tonight, it doesn't matter. If you have joy, it doesn't matter what your critics or your haters, it doesn't even matter what people that love you, because I watch it on the internet. I love Pastor Jeff. Next week, they're going to hate Pastor Jeff. And if, 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 I, if I was basing on everything on what they were feeling, I wouldn't be up here week after week. This is not a thin skin situation. You have to have thick skin like an elephant, but I have a heart as soft as Jesus. And no thing, no person, no cheerleader, no hater can steal the joy of Jesus. But happiness can be robbed from you in a blink of an eye. And it says, an expectation, I did a series in church on expectancy. First, you have to line your expectations in order to get this, with this joy that God is talking about with what God says you can have. And then the, the, the second part of expect and see is the waiting period. Well, none of us got here because we're patient. So it's, it's expect and, and then eventually you see, but because we can't wait in the and season, we'll never see it. We'll go manufacture some happiness, temporary happiness. And it goes on to say something great or wonderful, a feeling of great pleasure and happiness. Think about your life story and what you sought after to get great pleasure. And did it bring you happiness? It certainly didn't bring you joy. And it says a thing that causes or a source, um, a cause of delight. What is the source of your joy? What causes you um, to be joy? And what, what was the source that you used to go to to get joy, which really wasn't joy? It says delight, great pleasure, triumph. Joy, if you have it in your soul, allows you to triumph during a trial. It allows you to pass the test in order to have a testimony. It allows you to work through your mess because you're patient because you got the joy. You don't have to go fix everything right out of the gate. Allow God to fix it. I talked to a guy. I said, have you talked to your kids? He says, no, I haven't. I said, that's okay. Let God work on them. Joy will wait. Joy does not manipulate. Joy does not get ahead of God. Joy listens to advice. Joy goes to counsel for people that have walked before them. It goes on to say, exaltation. Joy will exalt you out of your situation. My situations are not good today. My circumstances aren't great. You wouldn't want to have what I have. 
Like Bishop Jake says to me all the time, if I give you the keys to my life, you're going to kill somebody. Everybody wants what another person has, which was said earlier tonight, but they're not willing to pay the price to get it. You got to pay the price to get this joy. And it says rejoicing, gladness, glee. But the opposite of joy is misery, sadness, sorrow, uh, mourning, and woe. There is no joy in self-pity. People that, that are struggling with self-pity in this room tonight, I used to be one of them. That is the greatest form of selfishness there is. I mean, if you did dope like I did and drank booze like I did and ran the streets like I did, you should be grateful you're above ground and out of prison. I mean, I mean, this joy that I'm going to talk to you about quickly tonight will get you up in the morning. This joy will change the way you speak. It'll say, I get to go to this meeting. I get to serve the homeless. I get to study. I, I remember being locked up where they wouldn't even trust me with a pencil in fear I was going to stab somebody. I'm grateful I can hold a pencil in the authorities' eyes today. That gives me joy. I'm grateful I don't have to ask permission to go to the bathroom because the time in my life that, that I was able to do that. And I, I came up with a phrase um, um, last night. Um, Gratitude motivates, entitlement suffocates. Gratitude motivates, entitlement suffocates. An addict with entitlement is dangerous. Anything you got today, you didn't deserve it. If you and I would have got what we deserve, we'd be dead. We'd be doing a long, so joy motivates, but, but, but in order to have joy, you have to have faith because the definition of joy is an anticipation. You don't need a level of anticipation to have something that you already got. Anticipation comes from something that's coming to you. And expectation comes from something that's coming to you. So it says in Hebrews 11.1, 1, now faith is the confidence of what we hope for. So I can tell you about this joy, but will you wait for it? I can tell you about this joy, but will you pursue happiness and go get ahead of God like we've always done? It's the confidence of what we hope for, the assurance about what we do not see. Joy sees the unseen. And if you can see the invisible, you can do the impossible. And how I was able to see the invisible, I listened to you, the ones that went before me. God does not play favorites. I said to this brother earlier tonight, I said, you got the gift of in, stand up. I said, you got the gift of in you. Yes, you. See, you had a hard time even acknowledging when I told you what God told me about you. You got the gift of influence. You got the gift of leadership. You're going to own things. God's going to introduce you to people that can change your life in one minute. You're going to do in two years in the coming years that will pay, get what people will never do. It will take 20, 20 years for a person. Let's give this champion a hand. People that don't have joy will listen to what I said to him and they say, yeah, whatever. And then he'll, if he doesn't have joy, he says, no, I'm a criminal. No, I'm broke. I'll never own nothing. Joy doesn't say that. Joy says, I'm going to receive what the man of God said to me. And I say that with humility, but, but I've changed my tune a little bit. I'm not too humble to forget about what's entrusted to me. You got to have confident humility, and that's what joy has. So it talks about this type of joy when it comes to Jesus. I talked to you about that. I showed you a graphic video before um, Easter last week where it says the crucifixion of Jesus. In, in Hebrews 12, it says, since you're surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses. There's a great cloud of witnesses in this room tonight that have this joy. It says, then throw off everything that hinders you. If you have things hindering you and you're allowing these things to weigh you down and you're not giving them to Jesus who can carry them for you, you're going to be in hindrance your whole life. Because when you first get sober, your consequences don't go away. Even though you feel forgiveness, if you actually do, you still have to pay the piper. And, it, and it's a hard situation, but, but it says, and the sin that so easily entangles the sin that so easily entangles me isn't addiction or lying, it's pride. Thinking that I don't need God because I'm good now and I got everything back. The sin that, that, that entangles me is pride, thinking that I can do this on my own. And it goes on to say, let us run with perseverance, the race marked out. You don't set the race. You don't set the course. You don't determine what path you're going to take. The path you took got you here. I mean, use a lot of common sense. Our best thinking got us here. 
And we're good thinkers. So it says the race marked out not by you, by someone else. That person is God. And it goes on to say this. Fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of the faith. See, a lot of us want to... We, we want to fix our eyes on things that make us happy. We want to fix our eyes on, 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 on our circumstances. We want to murmur and complain about our circumstances when we should be telling our circumstances about our God. We, we want to glance, as Leanne taught me on Sunday, at our circumstances, but we want to gaze at Jesus. We want to be fixated on Jesus and, and, and whatever it is for you. But, but when you do that, you'll get the joy. And it says now in this scripture that this joy that he had allowed him to endure the cross. The joy that I'm teaching you about tonight will allow you to endure anything. Anything. If it'll, it's the same joy that he will give you allowed him to get whipped, scorned, crushed, hung on a cross, nails in his feet and his arm. If that joy could do that for him, what can this joy do for you? It goes on to say, the joy is scorning the shame. This joy will remove your guilt and your condemnation.